from this subject the impossibility of neutrality the impossibility of neutrality amen or neutrality is impossible one of the things I love about the upper room congregation is you brutally honest if I read a text and give a subject that you understand, you really say amen <laughs> and get happy. If I read a text and give a, give a subject that you don't get, you say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the doctor, the PhD sitting behind me, he got it right off, right off the bat. He, he says, see, I see where he's going. Father, bless us now as we minister the word of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. The impossibility of neutrality. Neutrality. In our text, and I need you to follow me closely here because I have some things to say. Uh, brethren, I want you to cue the tape about the, the choir uh, from San Francisco and have it ready when I call for it. But in our text, we see Jesus speak to two opposing situations. Matthew covers one. Mark covers the other. Luke covers both. Matthew is Jesus dealing with the Pharisees. Mark covers Jesus um, at dealing with a lone worker. Luke um, covers both uh, situations, all right? So our Lord is speaking to two situations. To one group who opposed him and their opposition to him was resolute and it was so permanent that according to Jesus' own words, he knew that they would never be saved. And he concluded his words of the uh, resolute opponents by saying this, in Matthew 12 and 32, he said, Whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Isn't that something? On the other hand, Mark covers a lone worker who was so committed to Jesus Christ that the Lord declared to his disciples, leave this man alone. And Jesus said, the reward that I have for him can never be taken away. Mark 9 and 41, we find the Lord saying this, for whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, much less than casting out a devil. If he just gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, if he's assisting in the cause of Christ by giving you a cup of water. Jesus said to his disciples, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, that giver of the cup of water and in this case, the man was casting out devils, shall not lose his reward. One group will not be saved. The other lone worker won't miss heaven. 
And Jesus addresses both situations. The first group was not with Christ. As you can read again in verse 30 of chapter 12, it says, He that is not with me is against me. You see that? The second group or the second incident, that lone worker, was for Christ. For uh, Mark tells us that this man, Jesus says, for he that is not against us is on our part. So one group opposed Jesus. The other man was for Jesus. And there's a lot today that we are going to learn from our text and these other adjoining passages, if it's the Lord's will. But the salient point, the main point that I wish to make today is that, our, that when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ, there can be no neutrality. None. Let me tell you something. For the most part, as I look at the people who are here today, and especially those whom I know, um, Satan knows that, for the most part, Pastor, there's practically a 0% chance uh, that Satan has of getting you and the minister to denounce Christ. Mother Weaves, you know you're not going to denounce Jesus. Mother Frazier back there, 94 years young. Do you think Satan would even waste his time? Mother, how many years have you been saved? She was 12 years old when she met Jesus. And uh, 94 years later, 96 years, she's walking with the Lord. So he knows there's zero chance. Zero in getting you, her, and others in here to denounce Jesus Christ. And to be honest with you, because I'm a seer, I know these things. I know these things. I'm not always right, but I'm never wrong about these things. Crystal, Satan knows that he's not going to get you to denounce Christ. He's not going to get my wife to denounce Christ. We, 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 uh, we love the Lord. We love the Lord. But she does, my wife don't have pastor salvation. She saved on her own. She has a prayer life of her own. Jesus knows her voice. Amen. Amen. When she get on her knees, she don't get on her knees saying, Lord, this is Bishop Wooden's wife. She gets on her knees saying, Lord, I'm your child. And God knows her voice. And so Satan knows that she's not going to denounce Jesus. And that's not Satan's goal. Up Rome, I don't think Satan thinks uh, that we're going to denounce Jesus as a church. But the goal of Satan is not to get us to denounce Jesus. But if he can, his goal is to get us to sink into neutrality and many if not most in the body of Christ have neutrality not supporting or helping either side in a conflict or war neutrality 
The absence of decided views, expressions, or strong feelings about a thing. Many of us have taken the position, I don't judge nobody. I don't have anything to say. The Lord knows my heart. If them people over there want to live like that, who am I to tell them that they can't? Every man has to do what's, what he think is right. And I just, I just love everybody. And I'm not uh, going to say anything. There's a word for that. It's called neutrality. Subjects is making a little more sense now, right? And it's a little convicting because uh, we find that more believers are becoming neutral than are warriors for Christ. Neutrality. Um, I was in a conversation last week with a friend of mine from California. He's a good man, loves Jesus Christ. And we were talking about uh, various social issues. A hot one is critical race theory. And um, critical race, BLM, all that. And uh, he asked me my thoughts, and I gave them to him. One thing about Brother Wooden, if you want to know, if you don't want to know what I think, don't ask me. And if you do want to know what I think, just listen long enough, it'll come out. I don't know if that's good or bad, <laughs> but, but it comes out. And um, I talked to him about these things, and I'm going to throw something out, and I want to tell you something. Uh, the, the, the critical race theory crowd, the BLM crowd, those who are pushing socialism and communism and all that stuff, they're not concerned about black folk. They got you thinking that they're concerned about you. If they were, they would tell you the truth. You'll never get from the critical race theory crowd that the majority of African Americans in this country are middle class. They'll never tell you that. They'll never tell you that the richest people of African descent on earth live in America. They built their wealth in America. They made their money in America. America. The America now that they're teaching us to be angry at. The America whom they say uh, is so systemically racist. And yet, for every act of redress we've ever gain, gained in this country, what we turn to for the redress were the very founding documents that made America a country in the first place. Yeah. We're, we're going in a direction where they teach. I have the excerpts from books where they actually teach our people to be angry, to employ anger, and um, to, to affect you uh, that way. Praise the Lord. I think somebody on the phone. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> that was the first. <laughs> and so, <laughs> um, But if you look at what they, they're pushing, these people are pushing things where they're not really aimed, it's not really aimed at rescuing us because we're doing better than we've ever done. What are they aimed at? Biblical Christianity. I'll give you an example. The defund the police movement. 
Run, polls show that most African Americans are not for defunding the police. <laughs> polls show that. Because black folk know what we're going to get when you defund the police. You're going to get another thug crawling in your window. Or car, your car going to get jacked. You see what happened the other day, last night in D.C., trying to play a baseball game. They had to cut the game short for gunfire, gunplay. But in an area where the police budgets have been severely cut, they've been defunded. But the Bible speaks to cashless bail and letting criminals out and uh, treating criminals as though they are aren't to be punished or are heroes. The Bible says, and I'm talking about, you know, I'm not talking about the fact that there are times when the innocent, innocent people get convicted. No system is perfect, but some of the solutions that they're offering are solutions that go against scripture. And as a Christian, you can't go against scripture if you're going to be a Christian now. If you're not going to be a Christian, you do what you want to. You're going to go to hell for it, but if, you, if you're going to be a Christian, you have to agree with scripture. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men are fully set to do, are fully set in them to do evil. Now this is Bible. Are we going to dismiss this? As, it, as Ecclesiastes 8 and 11. And then uh, Romans chapter 13, the Bible says this about uh, law enforcement. Let every soul be subject uh, unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers, law enforcement, that are, that the, the powers that be are ordained of God. Read your Bible. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. Now, if we have a rogue cop, deal with him. If we have 10 rogue police officers, deal with them. But you can't do away with law enforcement because law enforcement is ordained of God. You all not saying amen. It says now, let me finish reading. And it says this, for they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Most people who get in trouble, get in trouble resisting arrest. So well, he had both hands on the steering wheel, but you're leaving out, he was trying to pull off. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil, but to evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he, the law enforcement officer, is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God. A revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. That's Bible. That's Bible. And so as... My friend and I had our conversations. He looked up some of the things that I said and he texted me back and said, I looked up the things that you said and I found every one of them to be true. So you have to ask yourself, who is the audience? What is the ultimate goal? I've been accused of being too hard on homosexuals. So, you know, he just wouldn't don't like a homosexual. That's not true. I love everybody. I don't have a personal uh, beef against a homosexual. I don't have a personal beef against anyone. I'm a gospel preacher. I want all men to be saved. I want all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth 
And I, but, I, but now, but now, I, I might as well be honest, Mother Hinton, while I'm at it, I do, however, believe in that brand of salvation that when you get saved, you come out of sin. Now, I do believe that now. And I believe that. I, I don't believe you can get saved and stay as you were. Now, I believe in come as you are. But some of these come as you are churches are really saying stay as you are. As long as we can keep bodies in the church, stay as you are. But the Bible teaches, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Amen. But the Bible teaches that we put, we put off the old man and his deeds and put on the new man who is after the image of Christ. Now, I do believe that. So I believe that when you get saved, you have to change. You have to come out of that stuff. What stuff? All of it. That's not like God. That's Bible. Uh, Paul said, Wherefore come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And God says, I will receive you. Now, I believe that. That's Bible. But we've been accused of being hard, so, um, and, uh, and so now I, I, I tell you, um, if you don't believe me and my assertions of what the goal of the LBGTQ plus, I, I don't know all the letters, because they, they add a new one every day, and I've just, I, I quit trying to keep up. Uh, I got other things to do. You know who I'm talking about. If you don't believe me for what they say they want to do, let's see if you believe them. Roll the tape. As we celebrate pride on the progress we've made over these past years, there's still work to be done. So to those of you out there who are still working against equal rights, we have a message for you. You think we're sinful? You fight against our rights. You say we all lead lives you can't respect. But you're just frightened. You think that we'll corrupt your kids if our agenda goes unchecked. Funny, just this once, you're correct. Stop right there. Okay, now, now apologize to me. Apologize to me. I, I won't. Well, you see this one, call me. <laughs> and said, you know, Wooden was right. Hear, hear what the guy said? And I ain't going to play the whole thing because he's not a good singer anyway. Uh, but he says, you think we will correct your children if our agenda goes unchecked? He said, this time, for once, you're right. The goal is to turn out your boys and girls, our children. Somebody turned him out. Now, now, uh, I'm be honest with you, I'm glad they made the tape. Because uh, was it Maya Angelou who said when people tell you who they are, believe them? All right, believe them. So for those preachers out there who say that we should say nothing, that we shouldn't be so hard, leave them alone. They're not bothering anybody. Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you. The Bible teaches that the children of the world is much wiser than the children of the light. Notice what he said. The question he asked, what are you afraid of? Even that, for those warriors in here, you, you, you defenders of the faith and eight o'clockers, you, you already know where I'm going. The rest of you, I'm going to help you catch up today. Those are tested, tried terms. And in their testing the terms, it came across, it would, they, they discovered that if you accuse people who disagree with them of being afraid of them, then it makes those of us who disagree with them appear to be operating from uh, the standpoint of fear rather than simply disagreeing on a biblical basis. So they will ask you, after it's been test marketed and tried, they'll say, what are you afraid of? 
See, because he's asking a question, but he's making an accusation. And he's making an accusation that you can't unprove. How do you unprove that you're not afraid? So your answer is, I'm not afraid of anything. But he just labeled you with being afraid by the simple question, uh, are you afraid that if we go unchecked? No, we're not afraid of anything. I tell you what we're all concerned about. We're concerned about our children. We're concerned about our grandchildren. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. Now, Jesus said that if a man would smite you on one cheek, turn the other. That's if he smite you. It's a different game altogether. They try to mess with your children. See, all that go out the window when it comes down to protecting your children. See, it ain't no, from a biblical standpoint, there's no other cheek to turn. So now if you're going to try to, to do to somebody's child what Don Lemon of CNN admitted happened to him, what, what uh, 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 what's it, Ellen, the generous, and other, these people were abused into that wicked lifestyle. And they are singing about what they want to do to your children. Now, let me ask you a question. What should the preacher say? What should we do? I me mean, help me out. You're smarter than I am. Help me out. Do, do we literally uh, say nothing? Do we walk in neutrality and, and do not express any strong views of our own? The same holds true with these vaccines. Whether or not you get the shot is your business. I have the only person that I've ever asked on this planet if they're going to get the shot was my 85-year-old mother. Now, if you got a problem with me asking my mother, see me after service. I'm, I'm going to solve your problem because that ain't your business. And she's my mother. I ask my mother anything I want to ask my mother. Uh, uh, well, what, what did she answer? She'll be here tonight. <laughs> Ask her yourself. But for the, I'm one of the few preachers in Raleigh, if not the only, I'm one of the few, who have not said to the congregant, do it or don't. That, that's your call. You, you didn't ask me about the last shot you took, did you? Okay, so that's, that's your call. But that ain't, that's not the problem. The problem now is we're in an America different from anything that I've ever seen in my life where all of a sudden segregation is all right again. They are now trying to shame people and segregate people based on whether or not they've had the shot. And, and all of all people, our sitting vice president, who, by the way, made history the other day. In June, she made history. Uh, the VP, Kamala Harris, is always making history. She, she made history again. She's the first sitting U.S. vice president to march in the homosexual pride parade. Let's give her a big hand. The first one. Ain't that something? Now, a woman who do not believe the Bible had the nerve the other day to say taking the shot is like obeying the Bible where the Bible says love thy neighbor. Now, let me tell you something. You're not qualified to quote Bible to anybody because you ignore the Bible. What about what the Bible says about killing the unborn? What about what the Bible says about perversion? That's some other question I could bring up, but I'm not. What about the Bible? What the Bible says? See, these people want to use the word of God. Y'all don't like my preaching today. They want to use the word of God when it's convenient. And then try to socially shame Americans for exercising their right. 
But I told you this would happen. I told you when they said the goal is to get as, as, uh, as many vaccines for people who want them. I told you that they were going to drop for people who want them. I told you that. And they did. Now it's for everybody. And they say, follow the science. Well, they told us for years, not for years, for months that children aren't affected by the virus. And then all of a sudden, on a dime, without any explanation whatsoever, now they're saying we need to vaccinate the children. First they warned uh, the uh, pregnant mothers not to take the shot. Now they're running trials on her. And they give no explanation. And then uh, they have come up with a new condition. They made one, a new one. They just created one. A new condition. It's called vaccine hesitancy. You have vaccine hesitancy. You have vaccine hesitancy. You have a condition. You need to see, you need to get your head examined because you have vaccine hesitancy. Oh, that I would, or someone would have pause about putting technology in them that doesn't have FDA approval, that was rushed to the market in nine months, rather than the, the customary six to 10 years. Um, and it's the only thing that, according to them, don't have any side effects. I used to, I'm a weird person. I won't be preaching too long. But let me, let me give you one of my idiosyncrasies. I, I like cod liver oil. So I used to take cod liver oil about 11 years ago. You know, the thing tell you to take a, a teaspoon, right? I liked it. So I, I take me a tablespoon full of stuff. <laughs> Stupid, I know. And uh, one, I began to notice, because it builds your immune system. So I began to notice that my joints are getting stiff. Hair is falling out. I thought it was just aging. And uh, I went to Pennsylvania. John was working up there. And he and Crystal and John Patrick. John Patrick was a baby in Pennsylvania. And so we went up during the mid month of uh, December. It's beautiful. Just all of the Christmas lights and everything. And, you know, in, in, in Raleigh in December, it gets cool. In Pennsylvania, in December, it gets cold. And it was good and cold. And so, this was during the time where they were afraid, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't travel with any kind of any liquid because of 9-11. So I didn't want to be accused of being a terrorist. So I left my car live all home and stopped by CVS to pick up some more. But they had a different brand. It was Nature Made. And on the Nature Made brand, guess what they had listed on there? Side effects. I read all the conditions that was going on in me. Hair just running backwards. <laughs> I mean, I've come to terms with it. I mean, hey, hey, you know. And joints, oh my Lord, I had, I had stopped doing push-ups, just... Everything's so stiff. And as I read it that morning, I had just, I had just, I had just drunk some too. I, I really wanted to, you know. But I threw, I stopped using it because even on the bottle of cod liver oil, they listed the side effects. My problem was I was taking in too much vitamin A. Now, how is it with this thing that are no side effects? 
And if there is any discussion of side effects, it's all labeled misinformation. Notice they never tell you what part is misinformation. They never tell you where it's wrong. They just say misinformation. So now there's an agreement between the government and big tech to remove, they might move, take me down for this, to uh, remove all misinformation. So unless you are speaking the party line, what you are saying now is labeled as misinformation. Is this still America? Do we still have free speech rights? And if, it's, if it is indeed misinformation, we all are born with brains. Let people hear both sides. People are intelligent. We're not stupid. People can hear and people can decide for themselves. But when you hide one side and only allow one narrative to prevail for Patrick Wooden, that's a big red light. That's not a caution, that's, that's a big red light. For why can't I be allowed to hear it all for myself? And then uh, I can make a decision on my own. And that decision is my business, just like your decision is yours. I don't have a clue who in here have or haven't taken the shot. That's not my business. But what I am, and I'm not saying do, nor I'm not saying do not. But what I am saying, what is this where you stymie voices and you only allow one side of a thing to be heard? And then if you don't agree with it, you are labeled as a, either an anti-vaxxer or you have vaccine hesitancy, or, you, or there must be something wrong with you. Brothers and sisters, that's not right. That's not right. Our First Amendment right is free speech. We are encroaching on people's rights to say, you, you, let me tell you something that you don't have a right to. You don't have a right to be heard but you have a right to speak. What we're not offered, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights doesn't offer you the right to be heard. It offers you the right to speak, you see. And what they're, what they're doing is that they're robbing us of both and only allowing one thing. Now, what if, what if uh, they're wrong? Then what? So the church is being silenced. I saw where a school teacher, I'm, I'm on my way back to Matthew, but I'm talking about neutrality. I saw where a school teacher the other day said if you're anti-equality, anti-LBGT, anti-vaxxer, anti-this, anti-that, the school teacher said, let everybody, let those people die. Now that was the conclusion of a school teacher. And uh, as I was watching her give her speech, I had a bad thought. Because I, I was looking at her thinking to myself, she's anti-gym. <laughs> what about that? <laughs> what about that? And, 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 and what does the science say about that? The science says that COVID is harder on people who are heavier than it's not. She wasn't going by that. Now, now, should somebody let her die? I wouldn't. If she was about to die around me, I'd do everything I could to save her life. I'd pray for it, uh, try to give her, you know. <laughs> CPR. <laughs> You know, try, 
Try to help her. Because you want people to live. Y'all don't like my preaching today. We're living in a strange time. A strange time. But when you follow these ideologies, when you're listening to these people, see, they, they are, they're coming against the Bible. The Bible teaches this. The Bible teaches that if a man doesn't work, neither shall he eat. Now, why are we allowing the government to get us used to free money? Why? You know, people are saying, why should I go to work when I can stay home and make more? They ask that question as though it is a rhetorical question. There is an answer to that question. That's a good reason why you should go to work. First of all, there's a dignity in working. Number one. Number one. Secondly, when, as you work, you gain experience. You, when, when you're home and you're on the sidelines and everybody else is out there working, the boss is going to remember the people who showed up. Who gets the job are the people who are in the groove, who have worked their way up the ladder, who have been out there on the job sites and everywhere else. And when you look now and you see on these work sites, you see all kinds of people, but you don't see us. So I'm home waiting on my check. That's part of the problem. That's part of the problem. I would rather work and earn less than to sit around and let somebody give me more. Mm -mm. Men work. Women work. The first, the first thing God did with Adam was he put him to work. Gave him a job and gave him a big job too. So I want you to dress the garden. My God, if you just do a study on the geographical location of the Garden of Eden, it, ain't, it wasn't that garden in your backyard. That garden stretched from the Euphrates down to Havilah, which is on the horn of Africa. All of this he was to keep and to till and to work. You don't like me. They don't want you to trust the Bible. If you believe that a man can turn himself into a woman, you can't believe that and believe the Bible. Because the Bible teaches that God made them male and God made them female. So they come up with these terms. Uh, your, you, if you don't accept uh, your uh, what, assigned, assigned gender. Now, nobody has no assigned at birth gender. See, even that, that's, that's a lie. You're either born male or female. Ain't no assign that the doctor assigned. No, that's a, let me look at it. That's a boy or that's a girl. And, uh, and a small, what, 2% or less of the, percent of the po percentage of the population, there's the amorphodite who is born with a uh, physical defect. That if you just watch them and let them live, Praise the Lord. It can be easily corrected. But God made them male and God made them female. Now, if you believe this stuff that they're telling you, then they can sell you a bill of goods and get you to distrust the Bible. Somebody asked me whether or not I, someone else asked me whether or not I believe in uh, critical race theory. I told them no. It's why. I said because critical race theory tells me I shouldn't believe it. They don't call it critical race fact. You need to go home and look up the word theory. It's a theory. It's a theory. So why are you teaching a theory as though it's fact? That's the same thing they did with the theory of evolution. They began to teach it as a fact. But you know what? Call me dumb, call me whatever you want. But I still believe that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I take God's word over Darwin's word any day. Any day, every day, and twice on Sundays. But if you can't trust God with creation, and if you can't trust the Bible with creation, what can you trust the Bible with? If you can't trust the Bible when it comes to human sexuality, what good is it? If you can't trust the Bible 
when it comes down to whether a man should uh, uh, be with a woman or a man. If you can't trust the Bible when it comes down to the sanctity of human life, born or unborn, then what can you trust it for? And that's Satan's approach. If we can, through the school system and through these other systems, teach the children doctrines that are opposite the Bible, because we're going to have them eight hours a day, five days a week. The preacher will get them for a couple of hours on Sunday if you bring them. That's another whole sermon. That's another whole sermon. I'm, I'm, I'm going too long on this. So, uh, so we, we dropped them off in these places where they are deprogrammed. Deprogrammed. Taught to respect the authority. Taught to respect the principal. Taught to respect the teacher. And then they get up and they teach the children. They unteach what the Sunday school teacher just taught. And you wonder why at 18 or 19, what comes out of their mouth is, I don't know if I'm a Christian anyway. And you look at them and you, where did that come from? I'll tell you where it came from, that's cool. And, and, and the fact that many churches, their youth ministries are just games, play. And we're not teaching the doctrine. We're not teaching people how to cope and how to think. Well, you don't like my preaching today. I can look at you and tell, uh, but I got you thinking. See, the devil do not want us to trust the scriptures. And many have assumed the positions of neutrality because we don't trust the scriptures. And that is why we don't have strong feelings about these things like we used to have. That's why we don't express them. One of the reasons we don't express them is because we don't have them. And we're trying to put people up, mother, and make them say stuff. They don't believe it. Some people are expert at being new, neutral. They make no definitive statement. Oh, I pay attention to you when I'm in a battle. And I see all of you. I know which of you I can trust when I'm going to war. I'm not stupid. And I know the ones you can't. They'll they say amen when there's no war. But when there's a war on, oh, just eerie silence. Won't, won't make a stand. Won't make a post. Won't say anything because they don't want to incur the wrath of the world. And that is by definition the meaning of the word falling away. The Bible said that that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. To fall away literally means to stand aloof. Yes, sir. All right. To stand away from biblical Christianity so as not to reap the wrath of the world. So you're still a Christian, but don't nobody know it. You're still a Christian, but you don't bother nobody. You ain't got nothing to say about anything. I'm just saved myself, and if that's what someone else want to do, that's up to them. You're refusing to take sides. But Jesus said, if you are not for me, Jesus said, you're against me. Jesus said, if you're not actively gathering together then you are actively spreading abroad Jesus doesn't allow for neutrality let me get ready to go home because I feel like I'm preaching to a church that's stingy on their amens today give me some love uh, Facebook y'all give me some hand claps and all that praise the Lord you know I'm telling the truth perhaps neutrality is possible and even wise regarding some issues and some people. But in the great struggles of life, neutrality is impossible. Every one of you who, who are gonna have, every one of you here and you watch it, you're gonna have to choose whose side you're on. For Christ demands it and so 
will the world. The demands of the kingdom of, of God, the demands of Christ are so exclusivistic uh, that to be indifferent or apathetic to him is to be on the side of the enemy. See, Jesus is calling us to exclude any and everything that doesn't, that's not like him. Praise the Lord. When he calls us to serve him, you got to let other things go. Praise the Lord. You can't have your foot in the church and in the world. Christ won't allow it. Praise the Lord. That's why you pledges. You can't do both. You don't like my preaching. You don't like my preaching today. Can't do both. You can't do both. Jesus is saying, you either got to believe me and come over here on my side. Or uh, even if you're indifferent, the Lord says, oh, you're not saying anything, you're speaking for the devil. The Lord says, oh, you don't have strong uh, convictions, you're speaking for the, you're, you're on the enemy side. See, you got you to stand up and be counted today. Oh, it's a different day. And I'll be honest with you, I love it. I love it because the real Christian is going to stand up. The true believer is going to stand Praise the Lord. It's going to stand. See, some of you, you are Facebook lions and you, you, you write more against the church than you do against the devil. You don't rebuke the devil. You don't rebuke sin. You rebuke the church. Well, the, de the church was made by Jesus Christ. Christ said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Christ said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. What do you mean being a member of the church and attacking the church? Well, I'm attacking you with your neutral self. You, you're walking in neutrality. You're the problem. God is looking for, y'all don't like this preacher. God is looking for men and women who will take a stand. Who will say something. Let me close here. We find in Matthew, see, because the time has come where we either believe that the Bible is right or we do not. Or we either believe Christ's truth's claims or we do not. They brought a man to Jesus. He was messed up. When Jesus got through with him, he was fixed up. Yes, sir. Uh, when Jesus got through with him, he was sane, sighted, and could hear. And I think that the people gave the right response, the regular folk, folk who had no authority, folk who had no positions, folk who had, praise the Lord, they were just regular people. When the regular folk saw that man, yes, delivered, the Bible said they were amazed and said, this got to be the son of David. That is, th th this has got to be the Messiah that we've been looking for. We've heard that the Messiah would come and the way he healed this man and cast this devil out. And, and most of y'all don't know this, but you see, Jesus was not the first one to perform an exorcist. Exorcisms were performed long before Jesus came. They perform exorcism in Solomon's day. But the difference between Jesus' exorcisms and their exorcisms is that they would have to use some type of enchantment. They would have to use some type of uh, dust. They would use some type of trickeries to get the devil to come out of the man. But when Jesus got ready to cast the devil out, Jesus didn't have a little bag. Jesus had no goober dust. Jesus didn't have any roots. Jesus just had power. And Jesus looked at that devil and said, come out of the man. Come out. And that devil came out. He didn't have to lay a trap for him. See, the people saw real power. And when they saw how Jesus did it, they said, now this man has got to be the Messiah. 
That's what the people said. But then came the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the authorities, the muckety mucks, all the ones who are up and in, the ones who had the power, the ones who supposed to have known better. And instead of them calling Jesus the Messiah, they call Jesus a fellow. Oh, this fellow. Oh, yeah, they're going to put him down, see? Well, he ain't nobody. This fellow. Now, we can't deny that he cast out the devil. It's, it's evident. But he cast out the devil by the power of Beelzebub. Who was Beelzebub? He was the prince of devils. He was the lord of flies. Beelzebub, the lord of filth. So instead of them recognizing that Jesus was operating by the Spirit of God, they attributed Jesus' power to the, the, the prince of devils. And when Jesus heard them say that, Jesus told them, and listen, America, Jesus said, every kingdom divided against itself uh, is brought to desolation. He brought in the argument of the divided kingdom because Jesus knows that when a kingdom is divided the power goes out of the window did you hear about the silly decision that the NFL just made they gonna start having two national anthems the national anthem and the black national anthem at some of the games now you want to see fights break out what if the white folk decide they're going to take a knee doing the black national anthem and the black folk decide they're going to take a knee doing the national anthem and all, now just throw in that beer, liquor, and all the drinking that they do at the game. If somebody's not thinking. It's the dumbest thing in the world. And I, will, I always thought that we were one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. The civil rights movement was not for us, praise the Lord, to have two anthems, but for America to live up to its creed that all men are created equal. And look at us now, we're trying to reverse all of that. It's not a good formula because the devil knows that if he can divide us, he can destroy this country. And Jesus said, any kingdom that is divided against itself is brought to desolation. And he said, every house divided against itself shall not stand. And I want to say to you, keep your households together. Don't let the enemy come in and divide you. And Jesus said, and if Satan cast out Satan, then his kingdom is divided and his kingdom won't stand either. But he said, but if I, by the power of the Holy Ghost, if I, by the Spirit of God, cast out devils, then I want to know, Pharisees, who gave your students power to cast the devil out? And then he gave the what's called the burglar argument. In verse 29, he said, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man and then spoil his goods? You know, John, a man can't break in your house. Uh, he first, he got to get past you. So I'd imagine that the burglar, if he see you out there cutting the grass, it'll come to his mind, rob the next house. Because there's a great big strong man over there and you can't break in. You ain't to worry about that little wife. We're all five feet, one inch, five, <laughs> whatever it is. But the problem is the strong man. Jesus said, I've come down here and I've broken into the strong man's house and I've bound the strong man. The strong man was the devil. But Jesus was able to bind him and cast the devil out of that man. 
And then Jesus said something to us. He said, now uh, the he that is not with me is against me. And he who do not gathereth spreadeth abroad. That was Jesus' way of telling the Pharisees, you're on the wrong side of this issue. You should be with me. And you really messed up because I'm actually operating by the power of the Holy Ghost. And you've just blasphemed the Holy Ghost. You've just attributed the power of the Holy Ghost to the devil and you've told you've told the holy spirit i don't want you and jesus said when you tell the holy ghost not now and if you die and you never said yes to the holy spirit he said you won't get the forgiveness in this life and you won't get forgiveness in the world to come you see no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost every one of you who got saved you got saved because the Holy Ghost was tugging at your heart but if you would have died and you didn't tell the Holy Ghost yes then you didn't get forgiveness in this life and if you don't get forgiveness in this life you can't get forgiveness in the other and those Pharisees were so hard-hearted and they resisted Jesus to the point where Jesus said, these folk are not even going to get saved. They, they are so against me that they will never be for me. And I want you to know that those Pharisees are in hell right now, burning, saying, I wish I would have given my heart to Jesus. But they didn't do it and they messed up and uh, in my clothes the story switches the disciples and they were a motley crew the disciples here they uh, saw a man casting out devils now what's interesting brother Kevin is that they saw a man doing something that they couldn't do themselves because in verse 18 and 19 of the same chapter, the, the man said he brought his son to Jesus' disciples and they could not cast the devil out of him. See, they had positions, but they didn't have power. And instead of learning to get power, those men walked around according to verse 33 and they began to argue amongst themselves, wanting to know, according to verse 34, which one, I mean, Mark 9 now, which one would be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus took a little child and hugged the child. Why did he pick a child? He picked the child because the child had no status. The child had no rights. The child had no power. And Jesus said, y'all trying to argue about a seat and to see who's the greatest. Jesus said, but you got to love people, not just the great ones, but even people who are like this little child. He said, you got to put your arms around them and love them. And so while Jesus was teaching them an object lesson on loving folk, whether they have status or not, being nice to people, whether they are rich or poor, respecting people, because people are people, while teaching them, John was reminded of a young man that he saw. And he said, Master, we saw a man casting out devils, but he didn't follow us. Other words, parochialism got involved. And parochialism is when someone is not of your group. It's localism. It's what you do when someone is not of your group or your denomination or your color because they're not in your group. Even if they're doing the work of the Lord, you won't help them. You'll stand back and let them suffer or you'll try to discourage them. This is why we had to help the baker up in Denver, Colorado. No, he's not black. 
No, he's not a member of our church, but he's standing on the word of God. So therefore, we put some money behind him and we put some prayer behind him to help him because he's our brother fighting the good fight of faith. The disciple said, because he's not following us, we shut him down. But Jesus said, oh no, you should have left him alone. Said, do not forbid him. Let's go home with this now. Said, do not forbid him because uh, for there is no man that shall perform a miracle in my name that shall likely speak evil of me. In other words, Jesus said you should leave him alone because if he's able in my name to cast out a devil, then that means that the man got to love me and said you shouldn't have stopped him because he that is not against us, he is for us. He's on our side. He's on our part. He's one of us. Saints, when you see a believer standing, you may not know them. They may not be your color. They may not be from your denomination. But if they're standing for Jesus, we ought to encourage them. If they're standing for Jesus, we ought to get involved in the fight. If they're standing for Jesus, we ought to give them an amen. I know what it's like to have to stand alone and you look around to see who will stand with you. But I wonder today, do we have anybody here who will get in the fight and say to the Lord, if you've been neutral, say to the Lord, I've been neutral long enough. Now it's time for me to let my voice be heard. I want everybody to know that for God I'll live and for God I'll die. I want everybody to know that I'm on the Lord's side. He's my savior and I have an opinion. I have something to say about these things, the things we see in society, the things we see in the world. You can't hate somebody because God made them white. You can't hate somebody because God made them black. You can't hate somebody because God made them Asian or Hispanic. That's akin to hating God. When you get saved, you love God's creation. You love people and you want to see folks saved. You want to see people delivered. And there's, a, there's something in you that causes you to pray that God will save everybody. Oh, the devil don't want us to think this way because he's trying to divide us. But I wonder how many will unite under the banner of Jesus Christ regardless to your race, regardless to your color, regardless to your gender. There's only two. Regardless to that, you will stand and say I'm on the Lord's side. I thank God. Hallelujah. I thank God. I thank him for medicine. I thank him for money. I thank him for all of the modern things that we have. But ain't nobody my savior. No one is my deliverer. No one that brings me out will see me through. Lift me up. My faith is in Jesus and in Jesus alone. He is the bright and morning star. He is my keeper and I'm on the Lord's side. Say yeah, yes. Let him hear you praise the Lord. Let him hear you praise the Lord. You ought to look at somebody, just wave at him and tell him, I'm on the Lord's side. I have an opinion. I have something to say. I have 
strong feelings when it comes to the word of God. The Bible is still right. The Bible is the written, infallible, inerrant, holy word of God. It is true. It is truth. And I stand on the word. Whatever anyone says, if they go against the Bible, I can't follow them because the word of God is going to last forever. Say yeah. Say yes. Woo. Lift your hands and praise the Lord. Ah, lift your hands and give him praise right now. Woo! Uh, I had in my clothes, I had Moses ask the question in Exodus chapter 32. He said, who's on the Lord's side? I'm asking that same question. Who's on the Lord's side? Oh, who still believe? I want to see you praise him. If you still believe that God is able, if you still believe that the church is essential, if you still believe that he is a keeper, let me hear you. Praise the Lord. Woo! I still believe it. I still believe. And he's been keeping me down through the years. Every day watches over me. Oh, Lord. I heard somebody sing all night, all day. Angels keep watching over me, my Lord. How many believe that still? How many know that he is a keeper? I can't, I'm hooked on that. He is a way maker. He is, he's the one, oh Lord, that healed you. If COVID got you, he allowed it. But didn't he bring you out? Tell him thank you. If he's kept you from it, tell him thank you. If he's watched over you, kept you from the thief, kept you from the robber, kept disease away, healed you when you got sick, picked you up every time. The Lord is looking and the Lord is asking, who is on my side? Who's for me? Who's for me? Who's for me? Who is on my side? And I'm not just asking, who is on my side when you're in church? And see, some of you are neutral in church. You don't want to say amen because you're scared the camera might catch you. So Wooden was saying that stuff, and we saw you saying amen. Is that the way you feel? So you've learned how to be neutral. But I want you to know, in the eyes of Jesus, if you're neutral, you're on the enemy side. In these here last days, God is looking for a few folk who will stand for him. Who still have strong opinions, strong positions. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Strong positions, strong opinions, praise the Lord, strong views, and willing to express them. The world has strong views. They push them down our throat every day. You get sick and tired of hearing it. And I guess Spectrum News is, is COVID crazy. Uh, all they do is... But now, they didn't have much to say about them Democrats the other day in Texas. 
who got on the plane to keep from voting. And uh, they flew to D.C. And all of them vaccinated. And several of them got COVID. They had much to say about that. But oh, let, let there be an outbreak at a church. Now you do know the definition of outbreak. The definition of outbreak is if in a setting, I'm going to tell you what outbreak means. If in a setting, two to five people are positive, that is an outbreak. Now outbreak, when you hear the word outbreak, two to five among 50 200, 300, 1,000. Two to five don't sound like an outbreak. But, but when you hear the word outbreak, what you think it, and, and, and all this stuff is tested. Oh, you envision everyone on a, on a ventilator. Everybody's dying. Everybody's sick. And look at what happened. When none of them may be. It's designed to mess with your mind. And again, again, I want you to understand my point completely. People, can, people should do what uh, they should pray, get the information that they can, and make a conscious, informed decision for themselves. That, 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 that has always been my dis- position. I, this is not a new position for me. I'm just not one of them preachers, uh, these guys getting online, and letting their members see them take the shot and all that stuff. And they're, and they're telling their members what to do and, and tell them you should come on and do it. Now, now these guys have no, they, they don't know any more about it than you do. Say, they say, well, I've done my homework. Where'd you do it? What, from where? You, you looked up what? It just, it just hit the country the first of last year. Or was it this year? Last year. It just hit. So now, we, we've been through, what, about 15 months of this? Yeah. What have you been studying? <laughs> and you're a preacher. It's not even your field. I don't know enough, mother, to tell you what to or what not to do about that. But I do know this. I know that God's a keeper. I know that you have a brain and I know that a decision, you're grown and whatever decision you make as an adult, that's your decision. You didn't tell me about the last shot you took, did you? All right, so I don't need to know about this one. But, but what people are being, they're being coerced. And the same people, same people. Now, they get mad with me because I personally don't trust depopulationists. Bill Gates, all them, he's a depopulation. All them people believe that the planet has too many people. The World Health Organization believes that there are too many people on the planet. Most of those people who, are, who have taken a particular belief also believe that there are too many people. So now, if you believe there are too many people on the earth and you bring me some grits, <laughs> what did you tell me you believe, sister? Yes, there's just too many people. And the thing that gets me about these depopulationists, in, in trying to figure out what to do about the population, they never offer themselves as a solution. I say, if you think that there are too many people, Fauci, you go. Yeah, them, let them go. Let them, let them help solve the problem. But no, they're not doing that. Those people are doing everything they can to live. Some of them, when they die, they try to freeze the cryogenics. They try to freeze the body, hoping that they can come back later on, you know, freeze the head and stuff. No, you're going to die. And I don't care if you're worth 300, you could be worth 20 trillion. You live in here. And you're going to stand before God. And you're going to die like, you're going to die. And uh, you're going to be just a dead. And in that funeral home, a little homeless man body going to be laying the same little thing. 
Same morgue, you know, one or two doors down, and both of you equally dead. Amen. And that's right. See, that's, that's, the, that's the great equalizer. That's why you want to be saved. Bible teaches this about our lives, and I'm done. Bible teaches that we're all like grass and we're all like flowers. We all come forth. We all hit our peak. Then you begin to fade. The Bible says, what shall I say? The Bible says, say this, all flesh is grass. The grass withering. The flower has its day, but it's fading. But the word of God abides forever. That's why you want to get in God and stay there. Because the word of God abides forever. Now, with your bad self, with your good looking self, with your strong self, with your handsome self, you fading. Ain't, 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 ain't nobody gonna keep it. I'm looking at your own eye and can't hardly see you. <laughs> I just don't have a problem with it, you know. <laughs> it's what it is. Say amen. Am I right, preacher? It's what it is. Everybody, that happens to everybody. That's why you want to get in Christ and stay there. Stay there. Because ain't, ain't nobody going to maintain anything but for so long. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will stand f f with Jesus today and say, Lord, I just want to be on the God side. Of history. A friend of mine told me, he said, man, I just don't want you to be on the wrong side of history. You know what I told him? So I'm not worried about being on the wrong side of history. I just want to be on the God side of history. That's the only side I want to be on. I want to be on that side where history will record that I stayed saved and true to my religious beliefs. Other than that, I could care less. Other than that, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. If we're against Christ, we're not for him. If we're for Christ, we're not against him. Who is for Christ? Who is on the Lord's side? Moses said, everyone who's on the Lord's side, come and stand by me. Them, them Levites move so fast. Because when you're on the Lord's side, there's no time to waste. There's no time to waste. Hollywood is against us. The world is against us. This is where we stop trying to curry favor with them. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. They, they don't want our favor. They want us to capitulate. They want us to acquiesce. They want us to bow down to them. Never. 